On that note, uh, let me just begin uh, with my talk. Um, as should be apparent from the flyer that uh, the sponsors of this event published, it's called New Perspectives on the Mughals, the cases of Dara Shikoh. And what I'm going to try and do today is have a conversation with you, not only about Dara, but also about his brother Aurangzeb. It's very hard to talk about one without actually also having a conversation about the other. So my talk is about 30 minutes. And I would be you know, very happy and grateful for any questions uh, that you may have after this. And I imagine Norman will be a facilitator for, the, for that uh, when the time comes. So on that note, I'll just begin with my paper. At the end of August in the year 1659, an armed retinue of mounted Mughal cavalrymen and mail-clad Baluch archers, accompanied by war elephants, made their way through the crowded streets of Delhi. At the center of this entourage was a very grim looking man, a very serious looking man. He appeared to be in his mid forties and was seated along with his son, about 20 years old, on an unkempt and unadorned elephant. Despite scorching midday sun, no hoda or umbrella protected the two men. Their clothing was coarse and dirty, and they were accompanied by a muscular and very anxious looking eunuch whose hand rarely moved from the hilt of his sheathed sword. To the residents of Delhi lining the streets, this older man was no stranger, for he was none other than Prince Dara Shikoh. But what had become of the man once the presumed heir and confidant of his father, the Emperor Shah Jahan? Was this the same man, the famous intellectual, who had once commanded a retinue, a household, of 100,000 persons and held sway over the Mughal court thanks to his fabulous wealth? Why were some bystanders sobbing, distraught? And where was he headed? The long and short of it is this. Dara Shikho, though the eldest and favorite son of the Emperor Shah Jahan, had recently lost a war of succession to his younger brother, the Emperor Aurangzeb. And following his capture by Aurangzeb's army and forcible return to Delhi, Darashikoh was brought before a judicial court appointed by his brother and largely comprising a group of Islamic jurists. Here he was accused of committing heresy, of unbelief, kufr, and more, he was called an imposter, an antichrist, a Raiz e Mulhida, leader of polytheists. An elaborated version of the chart sheet chronicled by Muhammad Kazim, the official court historian of Aurangzeb and the author of the Alamgir Nama, clarifies the accusations. Muhammad Kazim writes, and I translate from Persian, Dara Shikoh in his later years did not restrict himself to free thinking and heretical notions which he had adopted in the name of the Savof or Sufism but showed an inclination for the religion of the Hindus. He was constantly in the society of Brahmins, yogis, and sannyasis, and he used to regard these worthless teachers of delusions as learned and true masters of wisdom. Thanks to these perverted opinions, he had given up prayers, fasting, and other obligations imposed by the law. And it had become manifest that if he should obtain the throne and establish his power, the foundations of the Islamic faith would be in danger, and the precepts of Islam would be changed for the absurdity of infidelity. This is what Muhammad Kazim elaborates in his uh, text about Dara Shikoh. And so it came to pass that Prince Dara Shikoh was executed in the fall of 1659. What should be clear from the preceding commentary, as well as other passages sprinkled throughout the Alamgir Nama is this. The conflict between Dara Shikoh and Aurangzeb was framed from very early on as a battle between religious infidelity versus religious steadfastness. Under the terms of Kazim's triumphalist rendition, Aurangzeb is the avenging angel of a humiliated and embattled Islam who is forced to fight his brother on account of the latter's decades-long attempts to undermine Islam. In the centuries since Kazim put quill to paper, 
This view has come to be accepted by many Muslim historians, for whom Aurangzeb's supposedly steadfast adherence to Islam renders him as an exemplar ruler. Simultaneously, however, a parallel discourse has also come into being. Shaped first by British historians in the 19th century and then more recently by a curious alliance of both Hindu nationalist and secular historians, together they argue that the conflict has more tragic overtones, spelling as it does the defeat of a tolerant and syncretizing Islam by an intolerant and orthodox variant. Underlying this particular rendition of history is the idea that Dara Shikoh's defeat and Aurangzeb's triumph marked the onset of Islamic fundamentalism, which in turn speeded the collapse of the Mughal Empire and the eventual conquest of South Asia by the British. Given such readings, is it any surprise that the Dara Aurangzeb conflict stands as a totem for the divided interpretations of not just the Mughal period, but even South Asian Islam itself. On that note, I'd like to offer you a very brief sketch of the princely careers of both Dara Shikoh and Aurangzeb. Dara Shikoh and Aurangzeb were the first and third sons of the Emperor Shah Jahan and his wife Muntaz Mahal. They were born in 1615 and 1618 respectively, and they couldn't have been more different in terms of their respective princely careers. To give you one example, in Dara Shikoh we have a prince who almost never left the safety of the Mughal court following his father's accession to the imperial throne in 1628. In fact, other than one single and completely disastrous military expedition against the Persian-held fortress of Kandahar in 1653, Dara Shikoh never commanded an army, nor directly governed in a province until the War of Succession was upon him in 1657-58. Now, this is an extremely sharp contrast to his younger brother and nemesis, Aurangzeb, who spent most of his princely life governing in such varied provinces as the Deccan, Multan, and Gujarat, or leading military expeditions against Balkh in 1647, Kandahar in 1649 and 1652, and then again against the Sultanates of Bijapur and Golconda in 1656 and 1657. Where Aurangzeb worked hard to build diverse and varied political, social, and economic alliances in support of his princely and imperial aspirations, Dara chose a different and arguably fatal route. Undoubtedly, the most important facet of Dara Shikoh's life as an imperial prince related to his attempts to cultivate both an ever-deepening interest in Sufism, but also exploring the congruences between Islam and Hinduism. So, how did these interests unfold? Well, starting with conversations with various Hindu and Muslim mystics in the late 1630s, and his initiation into the Qadi Tariqa in the early 1640s, Dara Shikoh's intellectualism led him to compose roughly 20 books between 1640 and 1657. Two are of direct significance to my talk today. They are Majmul Bahrain, the meeting place of two oceans, which comprises or compares the vocabulary of Hindu and Islamic esotericism. The other book is the Sere Akbar, or The Great Secret, which is a translation, and depending on the manuscript in question, roughly 50-odd Upanishads from Sanskrit into Persian. Majmul Bahrain and Sere Akbar, in particular, would be absolutely central texts in making the charge of Kufr stick against Dara Shikoh during his 1659 trial. And yet, contrary to the charges leveled against him by Aurangzeb, or the more recent judgments of men like India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who has called him, and I quote, the greatest syncretist in Indian history, the truth regarding Dara Shikoh is much murkier. In fact, Dara Shikoh offered a rather different opinion of his own work. Thus, instead of situating himself on the fringes or even outside Islamic tradition, Dara Shikoh placed himself squarely within it, always defensively asserting his opinion that the universality of the Quranic worldview had been vindicated during the course of his own intellectual work. Furthermore, 
to compound our challenge of dealing with Dara Shikoh, he never claimed to be offering a noble example of religious dialogue in order to further Hindu-Muslim amity or understanding. To the contrary, as he clearly asserts in his preface to the Siri Akbar, Dara Shikoh viewed the Upanishads as Islamic texts witnessed by the Quran and bearing testimony to true and unvarnished Tawheed or monotheism. Now, you may be wondering as to how Dara Shikoh reached this most extraordinary of conclusions that the Upanishads, in fact, are a small i Islamic text. Luckily for us, Dara Shikoh relates the manner in which his intellectually, uh, intellectual journey unfolded. As he explains in the introduction to the Siri Akbar, despite extensive research and writing aimed at explicating the secrets of God's oneness, he remained filled with doubt. Finally, Dara Shikoh relates, he realized that he needed to turn to God's word, Kalami Allahi, itself to overcome his, his doubts, his distress. Naturally, he turned to the Quran first. Unfortunately, doing so did not offer him the kind of solace that he was seeking. Because the Quran was, by his own account, not mine, by his account, filled with subtleties and enigmas, marmuz. The prince turned next to other standard monotheistic texts. He specifically, in his introduction to the Siri Akbar, mentions the Old and New Testaments. Here again, the prince found little comfort or satisfaction. Like the Quran, these texts were also too enigmatic, too mysterious, and their translations were so poor, according to him, that they were, in fact, rendered